there is a tax professional, there is a fractional CFO, there is a bookkeeper for you. You just have to find somebody that you're comfortable with and that isn't going to judge you, who is gonna answer your questions and give you the service that you need. Introducing The Vixen Voice, a podcast for ambitious women entrepreneurs ready to move into their feminine essence, live their truth, and unlock their full potential. I'm your host, April Roberts, and each week I'll be interviewing inspiring women who decided to take a leap of faith to pursue their dream. Women who believe that they were born for something bigger. Hi, and welcome back to the Vixen Voice. Today, we are talking about a dirty little secret, how most female business owners need help with their finances. So tune in if you think you're in great shape or you feel overwhelmed when it comes to your finances, no worries. We have uh, my friend, client, and our resident expert, Megan Mansell, on with us today. Megan is the founder of Abundantia, Advisory, which is a luxury financial consulting firm. She's been a CPA for over two decades and brings a wealth of knowledge to the female entrepreneurs who she serves. So Megan, let's dig in and share with us what is this luxury financial consulting? I mean, you know, I like all things luxury, but share with us what you do for your clients. So uh, if you look at the, the regular terminology that everybody's using in the industry, it would be considered a fractional CFO. But in the industry, I think that that terminology has been a little bit overused and a little bit watered down by the types of professionals that are you know, offering those types of services. And so what I offer is a high touch financial consulting that mm. wraps in the boring stuff like the bookkeeping and the tax prep with financial planning and analysis and also tax strategy. So for seven figure entrepreneurs, it's kind of like having a very high quality CFO in their business, but on a part-time basis, because if you're, you know, under 20 mil in revenue, you probably don't need somebody that heavy in, in your business day to day, but you're still getting that quality of service. Yeah. And, you know, in your history, you recently left corporate America to mm -hmm. pursue this passion or in the last year. I know you were doing this on the side, right? But you really mm -hmm. wanted to do this full time and serve the women you help. And you were dealing with pretty big companies. I mean, you yes. were you were dealing with large budgets. So I don't know what you're able to share with us or comfortable sharing, but I just think that's important, you know, to share with anyone potentially considering working with you. So I spent over a decade at a Fortune 50 in, mm -hmm. in um, increasing areas of responsibility. And I did a lot of system implementations and technical accounting with that company. So I'm really good with any mom and pop business that's you know closely mm -hmm. held and their main concern is keeping their taxes low. But if you are a growing organization that's going to want to explore venture capital, that's going to want to explore private equity or going public, I'm unique in that I understand what's called technical accounting. And so in that Fortune 50, I worked on a billion dollar accounts receivable mm -hmm. uh, system implementation for an international region. Uh, and then a $4 billion domestic US implementation for the same system. Uh, and then I was moved and was responsible for the accounting of $15 billion in leases. So that was kind of my background going into mm -hmm. the director of revenue role at another organization that combined high tech SaaS software as a service with the mm -hmm. construction industry. And so that's where I left corporate America from was that director of accounting role. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. And you know, the reason I bring that up is, I mean, I know it's crazy. I, I built one company and sold it. And I always, you know, had strategic partners. I understood the industry well. I mean, always hiring is a challenge, but like I knew professionals I could count on to help me. And then when I started the Vixen gathering, like in a new industry, it was a whole new world, right? And finding the right professionals to help you 
really is a challenge, especially in today's world when everyone, like you said, so many people say they're a fractional CFO, but their experience ranges from maybe being, you know, an enrolled agent able to file taxes to like you're a level of experience where you've dealt with companies with billions of dollars. And, you know, I think there's a place for all these services, but um, yeah, definitely. I think it's I, I think it's really important for us to maybe help educate anyone listening, like what questions to ask to make sure you're kind of matching up with the right level. The important thing for, for business owners to know is really when you're dealing with your finances, you want a professional that is regulated. And so there's really, if you're looking at tax as a litmus test, there's three types of professionals that are regulated attorneys and in, in, in general you you may have a, a firm here or there that also has an accounting firm attached to it but your your tax attorneys are going to be handling your your tax cases like any mm -hmm. litigation with the irs or um very heavy in estate type taxation mm -hmm. uh, so i do work with uh, estate planning attorneys on uh, estate tax tax issues and things like that but that, that is one type of professional. The second type of professional is a certified public accountant, which is what mm -hmm. I am. And in terms of tax preparation and representing clients in front of the IRS, there is, for the most part, there may be a couple exceptions, 50 state reciprocity. So it's no longer like it was 20 years ago where you could only practice in your state that only comes into play if you're getting um, a financial audit. 90% of these small businesses that are in this market right now, they don't need. So for tax prep, certified public accountant, and a, an attorney, and then there's enrolled agents. And mm -hmm. I know enrolled agents that are better than CPAs, and I know CPAs that are better than enrolled agents, but an enrolled agent is somebody who maybe they just, they've been, maybe they've worked for the IRS before, or they've passed a series of tests by the IRS and the IRS recognizes them as somebody who can represent a taxpayer. But what the, the, the surprising thing is that April, if you wanted to, you could become a tax prep person and you could. Yeah, I'm going to say no thank you to that one. I but, always uh, believe I mean, in like, paying someone, but I get your point. <laughs> Yeah, so, no, but you want to make sure if you're a business owner, if you're at seven figures, if you're at multiple six figures, you want one of these three professionals overseeing your, your package. Because if there's an issue, if you're audited, the unlicensed, unregulated professional may not be able to talk to the IRS mm -hmm. and help you work through that. So mm -hmm. that, that's just the three professionals that I would you know, always recommend. And then the other thing is making sure that the professional that you work with is somebody that you're comfortable talking to. So many women come to me and they, they feel judged by their CPA. They're using the same CPA their family has used for 50 years. Um, and they just aren't comfortable speaking up mm -hmm. and asking the questions they need to be asking in order to get the service that they need. So it's really important to have somebody that you, you mesh really well with. I, I love my clients. My clients love me, but I'm not everybody's cup of tea. So mm -hmm. there is a tax professional. There is a fractional CFO. There is a bookkeeper for you. You just have to find somebody that you're comfortable with. And that isn't going to judge you, who is going to answer your questions and give you the service that you need. Yeah, I love that. And I really think working with any professional, you want to make sure that you have that comfort level. And really, I like to recommend, I mean, this is for hiring anyone on your team, for hiring outside professionals or anyone you work with, like have in mind your non-negotiables going into it, right? Like, hey, you know, it's really important to me. I mean, this is silly, but I take all my team calls on Monday and that's how I keep 
keep my calendar organized. So like if I'm bringing on a potential vendor and we need a weekly call, I'm checking to make sure they can meet with me on a Monday because, you know, I might choose to still hire them, but I understand that's going to upset the apple cart of my schedule. So a lot of times we don't have these conversations ahead of time and it could be something that simple and it could be turn it could turn out to be a totally more extreme situation, right? Where you didn't think through what you were hiring. And, you know, I know we were we didn't know we were going here, but here's my curiosity, Megan, because I've gotten very careful about who comes into the orbit of the business and also letting professionals go when they don't meet it. So, you know, let's talk about potential shame or guilt. Do you see that come up often when you're talking to women? Like they feel guilty letting this person go that can't serve them? Or I know it's not your area of expertise, but do you have any recommendations for handling that situation? Well, you know, I think that I know that in my corporate role, I was in a position where, you know, had I stayed, I would have had to make some very hard decisions and let some very good people go. But the fact of the matter is, is if you have an organization, if you have a business that has employees or you're supporting your family, uh, if having that individual in the business is putting the business in harm's way, or Mm -hmm. making it where there's a risk that you may not be able to support your family or the rest of the employees in the business, then it's not so much about the one person you're letting go, which is, I mean, it's very sad. Nobody wants to let anybody go, No, but it's not so much about that. It's about, you know, making sure that that business survives. I have a client that makes personnel decisions very quickly and It doesn't mean that she doesn't feel bad if she has to let Mm -hmm. somebody go, but she just knows what works for her business and and what doesn't. And so hire slow, fire fast, I think is what you're supposed to do. But, you know, making sure that those pieces of the puzzle fit because your duty isn't just to that one individual, it's Mm -hmm. to the whole of the business, the whole of all of your other staff. Um, And And also your clients you serve, because if the business is in trouble, you can't serve your clients, right? Correct, correct. Um, But I'm looking at it as like the team and holistically, if you Mm -hmm. if you take the clients out of it, and you're looking from a bird's eye to the organization. And there's lots of things that you can do to soften the blow, you can Mm -hmm. send them away with really glowing recommendations, you can maybe give a really nice severance package if you can afford it. You can set them up with additional training, just different things that you can do to soften that blow that aren't necessarily required by law, but are really good human things to do. And so I find that if somebody feels shame, if we find a way to also serve that person, then it makes them sleep better at night. And also consider if you're keeping an employee and you know it's not working out, you're doing them a disservice too. Mm -hmm. Because every day that they stay with you, whether that's out of fear or obligation, is a day that they're not living their genius. They're not to the place where they're going to really shine and and be highly valued and appreciated. So you're kind of holding them back too. So Mm -hmm. that's just that's just one way to look at it. Hey there, just popping in quickly. It's April Roberts, and I wanted to thank you for being a loyal listener of The Vixen Voice. It means so much to me. And because of that, we're going to be popping in these little announcements because I want you to be the first to know what's going on at The Vixen Gathering. So if you haven't done so yet, click the link below and check out The Vixen Founders Collective. The members who are already in are raving, and we would love to have you join Join us and the ultimate business consulting, networking, and personal growth community for Gen X female founders. See you there. And I mean, I feel the same thing we were talking about, like hiring professionals outside, right? They have to be a fit for what you're doing. And you can't carry that guilt or shame because it, 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 you know, damages the health of your business. So I love that. I want to circle around. So you went from the, you know, corporate America where you're dealing with these huge budgets and now you've chosen to step away and full-time serve your entrepreneurial clients. So what drove this change for you? Like, what do you love about what you do with your entrepreneurial clients? 
So I love that question. My mother was an entrepreneur. She mm -hmm. was an artist. And I'm sure that you, you've coached many creatives. Mm -hmm. The financial and the business realm for creatives is a foreign language. So yes. with, my, with my mother, she had an amazing business in the 80s and 90s before the internet was a thing, before all you had to do is post on Instagram and Etsy and all of these places. Yeah. She had a sales rep. She, she sold her, her products wholesale and she manufactured them in the backyard with my dad. So, oh, cool. but what was missing is you had two individuals basically with high school degrees who had no access to business acumen, to financial mm -hmm. acumen, using the family CPA, constantly being told, oh, your little crafting business is doing so well when she has a whole distribution center in our backyard. Yeah. So watching that and knowing what I know now, it, it started you know, going into accounting started because I thought, well, if my mom keeps her business up, somebody's going to have to help her with the finances. Mm -hmm. But what I learned going through business school and just learning in general, there were so many ways that she could have made that business a multi-million dollar business that she wow. could still be getting money from today. Yeah. She had no distribution agreement. She had no intellectual property. She, she could have licensed out the manufacturing and like totally removed the family from that. Um, she could have sold the business off, especially once places like the decorations, like you see now in like Michael's and stuff like that, yeah. like the little decorations, Hobby Lobby, that's the one. So you know, she could have been designing stuff like that. And mm. now she has nothing to show for it. So mm. helping women see that what they have doesn't just have the potential that they see right in front of them in the here and now, but they can build something really, really special uh, if they play their cards right and do this business thing right. Yeah, I agree. And, and what I love about that concept is, again, sometimes, especially for solopreneurs, they think, oh, I have to do everything right. And if you're doing everything, you can't be an expert at everything, even as you hire people. And you're there are things you're just not going to know. So making these relationships with outside professionals, like a fractional CFO, even maybe a fractional CMO, like to do marketing strategy for you, whatever makes sense for you, I think makes a ton of sense and, and helps them to, to see reality that's not in front of their face. So we talked about what you love. Megan, I, I love, I've been talking about this a lot with our guests. What maybe surprised you when you went full-time into entrepreneurship? Was there any aspect that maybe you weren't prepared for? Because there's always things that come up and, and we have to like get a new skill set, you know, find a way around it, et cetera. So, so what maybe took you off guard when you started full-time entrepreneurship? needing to invest more in my knowledge of how online business works from the operator perspective, mm -hmm. not necessarily from helping somebody else financially run their business, but investing in understanding how to do social media, understanding how to do content marketing. I was actually very surprised at how complicated that that can be. It is simple, but there's also a lot to it. Uh, especially in an industry like mine, where you're more highly technical the in trying to figure out how to portray your message in a way mm -hmm. that the bodies that govern you are okay with, because mm -hmm. there are so many people out there that are uh, not regulated, that are giving information that is very harmful mm -hmm. and that we can't counter it because our professional regulations state that there are certain things that we cannot say in our advertising. So that, that has been a, a challenge that surprised me. I thought it would be just, I'm like, Oh, how hard could that be? A little bit of Instagram and TikTok, but it, it, it's been one of the things that I've invested in the most heavily. Yeah, I feel your pain and uh because in my financial practice I was I was a series 65 so I was a fiduciary which is a higher standard than like a stockbroker and same thing we had to give advice that was in their best interest and there was like a lot of gray area so 
Luckily for me, it wasn't yet the era where we needed social media. We did have a TV show. And so most things, you know, we could kind of control what we said and put out there. But yeah, I can't imagine maneuvering social media with the regulations and everything. And on top of that, I mean, social media, yeah, it seems simple, but the algorithms, knowing what works, what doesn't work, getting shadow banned, it's so complicated for each media right now. You know, Instagram's so different than Twitter or LinkedIn that I almost think it's impossible to fully understand it all. This is really an area where when you can afford it and find someone who's actually good at it, I think it's totally worth investing the money. And then you have the additional hurdle of, does does that person understand what I can say under a regulatory context, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and can they yeah. make my voice? So I just wanted to throw that out there because I know a lot of my clients beat themselves up over social media. And I actually think you do an amazing job. I love looking at your content on Instagram and YouTube. And I think you do a great job. I think it's entertaining, it's informative, and it's uniquely you, which is important because we want to attract clients who, like you said, we want clients that we like and who like us, right? It makes the work more yeah. enjoyable. So I actually think you do a great job, but I hear this complaint a lot. So I just want to throw it out there in case anyone's listening and they're struggling with social media. You're definitely not alone. It's gotten a lot more complex and difficult. Awesome. Well, Megan, tell me, what do you, so you shared what you loved about your business, which is generally, you know, the on the broad scale, what is a particular thing in your business that you really like to do? Like, is there a part of your job that you just get in the flow? Like, I don't know, cash flow management, tax advice, like I'm just making up things, but is there a part where you really get in the flow and you're like, yeah, this is my cup of tea? Yeah, it's, I like, I'm very analytical. And mm -hmm. so what kind of sets me apart is I've done a lot of analytics and I know how to structure the data so that we can pull more automated analytics. And so actually, you know, setting up a file, making sure that whatever the business needs to track, we're collecting that data. Cause a lot of business owners don't collect the data they need to track to mm -hmm. make, meet their goals. And so mm -hmm. speaking with the client, understanding what their goals are, looking at the data that they already have, because uh, I don't just go with what's in your QuickBooks or your mm -hmm. accounting software file. I'm also looking at your operational databases, your, and if you have a POS terminal, like that type of data, mm -hmm. if you're collecting data in a CRM, I'm integrating that. And so, either improving what data the, the business is collecting, even if they have to do it manually until we can figure out a way to automate that, mm -hmm. um, or taking what they do have and turning it into something that makes sense for the business owner. That's what I like to do. So I get into a flow with that quite a bit. I'm taking some notes on what you said. I love hosting because I always learn things and I love being a guest because I always learn things. So, so thanks for dropping your nuggets of wisdom. But what I love about you talking about this is data is so critical to the health of a business and you can have a hunch about what you need to do, but until you see the numbers, it really shows you. I was just actually consulting a client's leadership team and I was like, well, I don't know what your flow is, right? Like, imagine we have an assembly line and this person comes here and then they go here and then they go here and they go here. Like, I don't know where the assembly line's breaking down. And so that's what data tells you, right? Like, is it breaking down at mm -hmm. this place or this place and this? And then you go into your creative problem solving skills to like figure out, okay, how do we fix this problem? So when you're working with a client, are you helping them to locate the problem or do you also go a step further sometimes and help Help them to come up with the creative solutions. Uh, it, it's case by case. I try mm -hmm. to come up with the creative solution with them. If if it's something that they want me to help with, uh, yep. some people they just need to know where to be pointed, and then they mm -hmm. have their internal teams to do that, which is fine. Um, but like for instance, I have a client that has um, two separate. I'll call them offers because I don't want to talk too yeah. much about what kind of business it is. 
So they have two separate offers, one that she started last year. And it's an in-person business. It's a local business. And she feels like that second offer has been really good. And it's the reason that she's had good client retention. But I'm like, but we're not tracking. Mm -hmm. We're tracking your numbers as one whole. So we need to break it out because the second offer, you know, yes, it may be profitable, but you need to know, is it worth the profit? that you're bringing yeah. in because it does take a lot of your mental energy. Mm -hmm. And so in your mind, how much money is that worth? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and how do you know if your clients who take both offers are taking it because you have the second offer, if you haven't even pulled them to see if that's the truth, like, has somebody told you that, mm -hmm. do you have customer surveys? And so working with her, to come up with a solution for her business to one, pull clients and see what's bringing them into the business. And, because a lot of it is word of mouth referral, but what makes them stay so that she can do more of that. And then two, giving her numbers for that second offer to say, hey, if there's no link between this keeping the, the clients in the first offer, then if the, this profit is X or Y dollars uh, of profit per month, is that worth your mental energy? Mm -hmm. So this is what you'll lose if you scrap it, but if you keep it, this is what you're gaining. So instead of making the decision, I feel, mm -hmm. you can say, I feel like, so let's see what's going on. Yeah, no, I love so. it. And a lot of times you're surprised. I know when we started like really tracking everything in our financial practice, it could show me I had multiple advisors working with me and I could see, okay, they're breaking down at this part of the process. So here's what I have to coach them on. And this one's breaking down at this part of the process. Whereas I didn't waste the group's time. I mean, there were certain things we had to coach on altogether, but then I could give individualized attention to my advisors, like on their specific areas that they needed help. And I could immediately see that by just tracking the numbers, like, you know, how many appointments they had with clients, et cetera. And so I think it's also, it's, it's valuable to you as an owner and it's valuable to your team too, so that you can give them help or serve your clients better based on the numbers. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of numbers. I think as, as they say, tell me the number first. And if I don't like the number, I'll ask for the story, right? Because how many times when you're trying to figure out what's wrong, somebody wants to tell you a story and it's like, no, tell me the number and the number is going to tell me the story. <laughs> and the more you understand them, I had they this, totally do. <laughs> I had this manager when I worked at the fortune 50 and yeah. if you ever did anything good and you went into his office and you're like, I did this, this is really good. He would look you dead in the eyes and say, a dot is not a trend. Like, <laughs> and so that's always stuck with me. Like you do something good one time that is not a trend and I'm interested in trends. So yeah. I just remember that. And that was the pre-COVID corporate era, you, you know, yeah. where yeah. your your butt's in the chair from eight to five, Monday through Friday. So that that was just something he always said. Sometimes he would even say it from a business perspective. You're like, yeah. oh, this entity did really good this month. And he's like, yeah, a dot is not a trend. So yeah. it doesn't matter. Well, and a lot of, you know, I, a lot of women I speak to like through coaching or chatting about our coaching programs or just friends of mine, a lot of times they're afraid to hire because they're like, how do I manage the team? I, you know, I'm comfortable doing everything. I don't want to be responsible for everyone else. But I think if you have your numbers locked and loaded, then it really helps you to oversee things better, right? So I just had a friend, mm -hmm. you know, we, we just meet every couple of weeks kind of to share war stories because I think it's important to like not take yourself too seriously and we'll kind of be like oh here's what's going on and I wanted to check in with her because she had to let two people go and I knew it was really weighing on her heart and I was like hey I'm just here to listen lay it on me let's go and then it turns out she let her sales manager go because she had worked there for four months and not made a single sale 
not a single sale in four months. And when she was having this conversation, the woman was surprised she was being let go. Like, how can you be a sales manager and realize you haven't made a sale in four months and be shocked that you're being let go? But, you know, that's the power of the numbers, because if she didn't have numbers or it wasn't like statistically based position like that in that position, you know, that can be a very difficult conversation. Well, I don't understand. Why am I being let go? Whereas if you have metrics and goals that are clearly articulated and expectations set, that conversation becomes easier, right? And and not just in letting people go, but mm -hmm. in coaching them up in their position as well. I just think that it makes it a lot easier. And I'm sure you help your clients with this as well, because I know many women yeah. stress about managing teams. Yeah, and so I do have a client that where we've set uh, efficiency metrics, Mm -hmm. And then we look at the performance of each professional in a vacuum of what's going on in that professional's realm. Mm -hmm. If they're revenue generating professionals, we need to make sure that the revenue that they're generating is higher than what you're paying them. And if it's mm -hmm. not, is it a training issue? Is it a workflow issue? And how do you fix that? Now, going back to the, the sales manager being let go, sales, sales positions are kind of unique in the large corporate yeah. environment that I come from. Like a sales manager, sales director, they're not responsible for making sales. They're responsible for Correct. building teams. So if I had a client that came to me and said, I have to let my sales manager go, the first thing I would look at is, so what does that sales manager think they're supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. Because if that wasn't communicated that you are a salesperson and they're in yeah. sales management and they built you this amazing team that's like kicking, kicking booty and making sales, they've done their job. And then you just need to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, I need you to also sell, I need you to at least yeah. make up your salary. And, and so I think that sometimes as women, maybe we don't communicate that type of stuff as yes. directly because mm -hmm. we're so used to you with qualifiers, with our language, being direct in, in our expectation is what we need to work on. And so yes. in that situation you just shared, I don't know the situation. I think she misused the term sales manager because this person had a quota of expected mm -hmm. sales to deliver okay. that they weren't delivering. So it's a smaller company. I don't think it's as, you know, efficiently titled as, as it should be, because I agree with you. In fact, I used to joke that most large companies I knew did a disservice because they would take their best salesperson and make them a sales manager. And I'm like, you're wasting talent. Let them keep selling right so you you are right in larger context and and i like i like what you brought up about women watching the qualifying language and being more direct because it's it totally is true and i think the clearer you are with team members and we're all guilty of this at some point not laying out expectations very clearly and so you always have to say okay what was expected and what was communicated and is it clear what was expected to be delivered so how i and i know this is outside of your area of expertise but you brought it up but how would you recommend to be more direct and drop the qualifying language or maybe give an example of it So just drop the qualifying language. I expect X instead of, if you could, please. Mm. Because if you could means if they can. And whether or not they can is not objective, it's subjective. Yep. Because they can think, I can't do that. And you can say, I know you can do that. So who's correct? Yeah. Like it's, you've got to have something to, to measure. It's kind of like when you work on, on a resume, you need to be like, whatever your bullet point is on that resume needs to speak to what does it mean for the company that you worked for? I designed and implemented SOX controls in six months. Yeah. But what did, what did that do? Well, mm -hmm. I designed and implemented SOX control so that we would regain status with NASDAQ. Okay, that's a really big deal. So kind of looking at language that tells them what's in it for them mm -hmm. and then also doesn't leave room for interpretation. Mm -hmm. Love it. 
So Megan, a lot of women who listen to this podcast and a lot of my clients still have corporate jobs. They have a side hustle that they want to turn full time like you did. So what advice would you share with someone who is in the position you were in where you were juggling both until you went full time? Like, like what do they need to be prepared for or kind of what are three tips you would give someone looking to make that transition from corporate to full time entrepreneurship? So, um, if you're, if you're single and you're the only Mm -hmm. one that's bringing in income, you need to have six months of your living expenses at minimum is what Mm -hmm. I would recommend, but I'm blessed, you know, I'm married, my spouse has a job and I also, you know, have investment property. Mm -hmm. So I, even though I'm, am going to have to tap into my savings, I still have stuff that kind of offsets that. And if you're in that position, just make sure that the debt that you're going to have to go into is going to be for business development, Mm -hmm. not your living expenses, because you're going to become very stressed out. Now, I wish I could have waited two or three more months Mm -hmm. myself, but I was in a situation where I had to, I had to make a quick decision Mm -hmm. and it was... I took a guaranteed amount rather than a, maybe this will work out amount. So Mm -hmm. that was kind of, you know, what pushed me off was the company that I was working for was in a situation where some cuts needed to be made and it was either going to have to be me or multiple members of my team. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had this other thing going, so I felt comfortable making the jump, but you know, I'm an advocate for staying in that corporate position as long as you can, as long as you're not jeopardizing your reputation, as long as you're not violating any ethical rules or Mm -hmm. anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love that. And you said made the jump and I, I kind of say it's always a leap of faith because it's highly unlikely because, you know, most of the women I talk to are well paid in their corporate job, and it's highly unlikely you're going to get your side hustle up to the same level of income before you're able to make the switch, right? So just understanding mm-hmm. that you have to have enough yeah. momentum going, enough confidence in what's going on here. And like you said, having six months or more of living expenses socked away really helps with that um, because it is a leap of faith. And, and there are no guarantees when you walk away from corporate into business. But I mean, my opinion, it's so worth it. But I've been out of corporate for a very, very, very long time. So I'm a little bit biased in that. So I love it. So six months of living expenses. If you're going into debt, do it for business development versus living expenses. I think that's a great, great distinction. And then finally, if you can, like hang on as long as you can, as long as you're not hurting anyone, right? Your business, your reputation, et cetera. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much for that. Well, Megan, as we wrap up, I know you've been on before. You were on a lovely panel with Karen. We were talking about financial abundance, but I'd love to just ask you again, when do you feel you're most feminine? Because I really do think being able to tap into that helps us keep going. Uh, I feel my most feminine when I'm helping a woman build her dream. Because I think, you know, if we look back in time, civilizations were built on the women collaborating. Mm -hmm. And so much of the society we've found ourselves in has been kind of set up to make us fight amongst each other. And when we do that, it it really holds us back because we are very powerful when we all band together. Yeah, no, I agree. I I think it's super powerful and it's actually the basis for me starting the Vixen Gathering. I think if more women could support each other lovingly and collaboratively and create together, it's what our world needs right now. So I love that. Thank you. And what color is your feminine energy? If you had to put a color to it, what would it Um, be? Probably like pink, purple-ish. I mean, like the traditional girl colors. Um, like it. I, I just feel more girly if I'm in, in pink or, or purple. 
cool. Oh my gosh, it was so funny. I was somewhere yesterday and I was paying with my pink wallet and the guy helping me was like, oh, like, I don't know. It was so funny. We had a whole conversation because apparently I had a pink shirt on a pink wallet and he was like, hmm. He made some joke about pink. Like it was actually, you know, he was super friendly. It was cute. I was like, huh? And he was like, yeah, you have a pink shirt on in your driver's license. You're wearing a pink shirt and you have a pink wallet. So I kind of figured it was your favorite color. And I was like, oh, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> anyway, fun stuff. Awesome. Well, Megan, thanks so much for having, for joining us today. You brought up some great points. And, you know, I like to say dealing with your finances is kind of like getting a divorce. I was a lawyer and I got divorced. I hired a lawyer to handle my divorce, right? Because you don't want to be emotionally caught up in what you're doing. And for so many of us, money is emotional, even though we work to move past mm -hmm. that. And so I just think finding a professional like Megan to help you be a little more unemotional about these decisions, yet honoring the fact that you're going to be emotional about it, which is, I think, the difference of working with a woman like you, Megan, is so critical to success. So I love what you do. Thank you so much for the points you brought up today. As we're wrapping up, is there anything else you'd like to share with all of our amazing listeners? Well, we're, as, as we're filming this, we're, you know, in early September, September 30th is the end of quarter three. Quarter four is really your tax planning season. And mm. so if you're wanting to minimize the taxes that you pay for tax year 2024, you have to make decisions and implement strategies before December 31st. And so the earlier that you're working on that, the better. Otherwise, you're going to get in a situation where you're going to be told once again, all we can do is file your taxes and then work for 2025 to make that better. So if you're really serious about optimizing your business processes and finances for 2024, this is the last push to do it. So. I love it. Thank yeah. you so much for that because we all need a little push sometimes. Awesome. Well, everyone, if you're listening, I hope you took away exciting nuggets like I did. And if you're on the fence considering if you're going to leave corporate and go full-time entrepreneur, schedule 20 minutes with me. I'd love to have a chat with you. I'd love to talk to you about it and find a financial professional like Megan. Reach out to Megan and see what she thinks. Let's get a great team together to help Help you make that leap. And as I always say, the world needs a little more love. So I'm challenging you all. How can you show up more in love with yourself today? Oh, and Megan, one thing we didn't touch on, you always say that taking care of your finances is an act of self care, right? So I'm going to, it extend really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. So I'm going to extend it to self-love. So here's my challenge I'm going to give you. How can you lovingly look at your financial situation right now and find a way that you can love yourself more, either by improving it, getting better control of it. And sometimes it's just being aware of what you have, right? It's absolutely critical in today's world. So go love yourselves. Reach out to Megan if you think she can help you. Reach out to me if I can help. Have a phenomenal day. And Megan, thank you again. Okay, thanks. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to hit subscribe so future episodes are automatically downloaded directly to your device. And if you want access to today's show notes, including links to all the resources we mentioned, visit vixengathering.com slash podcast. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you next week for another episode of The Vixen Voice.